I think we have about three more minutes, so. So for our people in school, it would be on their website or on their Tinder building? Right. Uh, so on the yeah, school, on the building. it would be on your building, okay. is what they were saying. Or, so, on, or on social media, or, I mean, Yeah, as long this as is published. Okay. Yeah. In the back, how much time do we have? Sandra? Last question. Okay. Okay, I be, that, I believe that was, there was another one that was buried, but it says community concerns and input regarding aforementioned duties and responsibilities. Um, so yeah, absolutely, your community concerns, I mean, that's, that's what a SAC meets for. Um, parent concerns, that's what a SAC meets for. So. So the number four got swept into. Yeah, it, yeah. To a bullet. Sorry about that. Thank you guys very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, I think she'll just take it down. You take it down. All right. So we're back on time. Um, if you are going to stay for Scott Smith's presentation on school budgeting, you're welcome to stay here. Todd Warnicke is in the library upstairs. Uh, up, don't ever go which way I point that my library um, to, to talk about the master capital plan. We will have people come around and get you guys to go into our feeder groups because you'll be in these for about half an hour. So thank you very much. If you need to use the restroom, grab water, whatever on your way, please do so. Thanks.
Um, most of you know Scott Smith, the director of budget for Douglas County School District. Um, he's going to give you a presentation about school budgeting. It's a very complex issue, so uh, probably won't pay attention and don't make me shush you like later in, so we're going to answer the Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Senator mentioned, my name is Scott Smith. I'm the director of budget. Uh, before I start, I do want to introduce, we have the whole district financial team almost back there. So Bonnie Betts is the CFO. Janice Schleisner is our director of finance. Teresa Rausch is our director of strategic sourcing. And then our four budget analysts, so Alexandria Bollaby, Colleen Doan, Jesse Shaw, and Rebecca Brooks. I'm glad I did not forget anyone's name. <laughs> So they do a ton of work to help support all of our schools and departments. So I do have a thorough presentation. I'm going to ask that you hold any questions at the end to make sure I can get through the whole thing, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So just to give you an idea of where we're going, we'll talk a little bit about school finance in Colorado, um, how we compare to other school districts in the metro area, how we do school budgeting here in Douglas County and many other of the large districts in the area as well, how carryover works, possible budget priorities, that's what you're going to be discussing tonight, so not only district priorities, but school budget priorities as well, what we think funding might look like next year, and then any questions that anyone might have. So the first thing that is important to realize is there's really two separate sources of funding. So operating funding that pays for everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So teacher and staff salaries and benefits, utilities, transportation, everything we do um, from an operating standpoint. We get the vast majority of our money from what they call the School Finance Act, and I'll talk more about that, but that's how Colorado distributes money to its school districts. We get a little bit of what they call categorical funds, so those are things like special education, vocational education, GT, but when I say little, I mean little. To give you an idea for special education, we get $11 million, and last year we spent $57 million. So they definitely do not cover the costs of those programs. They help offset some of the costs. Federal grants, we don't get a lot of title funds. Title funds are based on poverty levels mostly. So being in our district with our demographic, we don't get much of that. Uh, we do get some funding for special education from IDEA. That's an additional $8 million that we spend on top of that $57 million that I mentioned. So in reality, we get funded for about $19 million and spend about 65 million on special education. Mill levy overrides, we've passed four local elections here. That's just a fancy term to increase our local budget by increasing local tax dollars. And then there's really capital funding. So building funds, those are referred to as general obligation bonds mostly. So those are voter approved bond issuances. So when you build schools or renovate major projects, you can pursue a bond election. We haven't had one of those since 2006 be successful in our district. Um, the other avenue, it's a fancy term called a certificate of participation. The biggest difference here is that a bond has to be approved by the voters. A COP has to be approved by the board. The other difference is that if we pass a bond, we can tax for the debt service, so there's no impact to the school district. If we do a COP, we have to pay the debt service out of our general fund. So really, the question is, does it impact the taxpayer or does it impact the school district? Um, these two methods to pursue capital funding. And I put this note down here, you can use operating funding to address capital needs. Operating funding can be used in any legal purpose, whether it's capital, operational, whatever it may be. People don't think. You can never spend building funds on operational needs, but you can spend operational money on capital needs. So it can only go one way. So this great chart is the easiest way to explain how the School Finance Act works. And I'll walk through what it is. Essentially, the CDE counts how many students you have. And then they run a really complex formula to determine how much money you should get for each student. And that's the per pupil revenue, let's see, down here. And that equals what they call total program. And I will get this post on the DAC website, so for those of you who want to reference back to it, I think they surprised me in their live streaming it as well, so you can probably watch it there. Um, so they calculate how much we should get, and then they look at the local share. So if you look at your tax bill, there's a tax for the School Finance Act. It's a fixed tax rate. You'll hear me talk about mill rates. Mill is just a fancy word for tax rate. It's about 25 mills in our county. So how much that raises, the state then fills in the rest. And that's the important thing if you've been to board meetings or watched me recently that I've been hammering home is that the state takes out the local share and then they fill in the rest. So all of you who are paying more property taxes this year because your assessed values jumped doesn't mean any additional revenue for the school district. All it does is change the breakout between local and state. It, sta it saves the state money. It doesn't provide the school district more money. So keep that in mind. 
Um, this is how it's supposed to work. But if you watch the state share, so the next slide's exactly the same, but this is how it's supposed to work, and this is how it actually works. So the state share dropped by about $63 million. Because not only when the state runs this formula do they only fill in what's left over, they have now decided that they can't afford to fill in what's left over. And that's what's called the negative factor. It's just the fancy word for the cut that K-12 takes. Our negative factor is just over $60 million every year just in our school district. So $1,000 a student every single year or $375 million that's been cut from us since the beginning of the recession. So nothing changes. Your local property taxes all still come here. The only thing that changes is that the state reduces their share on their contribution to the school district. So when they run the really complex formula, we end up with the lowest amount of funding on the front range. The blue bars is what the state controls in the School Finance Act. The red bars are what I referred to before, the mill levy override. That's what we can control through local elections. So if you look at the blue bars, Littleton's a great example where Littleton and Douglas County have almost the exact same per pupil revenue. I believe it's like five or six dollars difference, which makes sense because the demographics are very similar, and that's how the School Finance Act works. The difference is, is that they have passed a lot more on a per pupil basis in override, so that drastically increases their per pupil funding because they have supplemented the state funding with those local overrides. So in both the School Finance Act and Mill Levy Override, we're the lowest funded school district on the front range. And what that means in real dollars is if we had the same amount of per pupil revenue as Boulder Valley, we'd have an additional $113 million each and every year to spend on operational needs. Even the next lowest funded district, Adams Five Star, would be $32 million a year every single year based on the size of our district. When you take those differences in the per pupil amounts and multiply it over 64,000 kids, it makes a big difference in the amount of operational funding that we have. So that was kind of the overview of how the state works and how we compare, and I want to shift into how um, we do school budgeting in Douglas County, and this really refers to our neighborhood schools. So student-based budgeting, site-based budgeting, SBB, you'll hear those terms kind of thrown around interchangeably. Um, the idea is that instead of the finance officer and the HR officer sitting in an office making decisions about how many teachers each school gets and what things are going to be, that the decisions made closest to the students are the best decisions. And especially in our in a district our size of almost 900 square miles, a 500-kid elementary school in one part of the county is not the same as a 500-kid elementary school in another part of the county. So the idea is that because our communities are different, and that the stakeholders in those communities, they should be parents, employees, students, should all have a voice in what those budget priorities should be, and that's really what you're doing at your SAC meetings, and then here at the DAC as well, talking about district priorities. And so, as the name implies, we allocate dollars to schools based on enrollment. So, just like the state funds school districts in Colorado based on enrollment, we have that similar model to fund our schools within our district. Other large school districts do this. Denver has done it for a long time. Jeffco does as well. Poudre up in Fort Collins. So this is um, a methodology that's used throughout our state, especially by the larger districts. So the thing that I think is important is that funding changes throughout the year. So we build our budgets based on projections. We obviously don't know how many kids are going to be in school next year when we have to build our budgets. But then we have CDE's famous October count, and we know how many kids we actually have. And that changes the budget at October count. We also calculate what carryover will be, and I'll talk about carryover. That gets allocated out in the next year. And then the state, um, I'd say, graciously provides us with additional resources like Read Act money and other different grants and things like that throughout the year. So we don't know exactly when they're going to come, nor do we know exactly how much they will be. So as those additional revenue sources come to the district, school budgets will change as well as we allocate those out to schools um, so that those dollars do get out um, to the end user. We budget everything based on average salary plus about 36% in benefits. So we budget by average salary so that principals don't have to make a determination in hiring based on the salary of the person that they're hiring. Their budget is impacted exactly the same if they get someone straight out of college or someone who's been a 30-year veteran. Everything is on averages. And I know there have been some questions about why our average is different than CDE's average. So the first thing I'll say is that we recalculate the average every single year. Um, one of the analysts back there who remain nameless can attest to how much time they have to spend calculating average salaries, but we recalculate it every year and it's based on our actual population. But the biggest difference is that CDE includes all schools, including charter schools. 
and charter schools generally have lower salaries than the neighborhood schools. They also include all certified, virtually all certified positions, whereas we only look at the staff that are in neighborhood schools, and we only look at what I call classroom teachers. So your typical classroom teacher, your specials teacher, things like that. We have separate average salaries for special education teachers, counselors, response and intervention, kind of the big classifications within certified staff. So ours is much more granular, where theirs is much more big picture. The only thing I will say is that schools' budgets, about 80% of it is what we call discretionary. Principals have the discretion on how to spend that. About 20% is non-discretionary, mostly around special education. So you will see that in your school's budget. Your principal has no control on how to spend that money. They must spend it in the manner that the special education department tells us to allocate it to the school. So there's no discretion in things like special education, ESL. Um, there are some other ones, but those are really the big ones. So this is a, just a copy of this year's budget sheet, and I want to talk a little bit about one of the things that leads to a lot of confusion. I understand why it leads to a lot of confusion. A lot of people see the number at the top, and they say, okay, $3,900 per student times 580 students gets me $2.2 million. Well, the district gets $7,000 a student. Why does the school only get $3,900? And the reason is because there are a lot more allocations, even on the school's budget, but also in direct support of the schools that you don't see in that $3,900 number. So as you go down the sheet, the first thing you'll see is that there are other discretionary allocations that have some really specific names on them. They're not specific in that they're discretionary. The principal can allocate that money however they choose, but it's in addition to the $3,900 per student. All of the non-discretionary, as I mentioned, we essentially get funded for one-sixth of our special education cost. The rest of that special education funding comes out of the $7,000 per pupil that we get. So all of the discretionary funding, all of the non-discretionary funding to the, a large degree all comes out of that same $7,000 per pupil. So there's more allocation than just that top number. And I know that can be confusing because that's the top number and we talk about student-based budgeting, how much does each student bring with them. But there are allocations on top of that one $3,900 number. So if you really want to know, and the detail is out there, you can look in our budget book to see exactly how much is being spent at your school. So put in here, starts at page 167. Each school has a page on how much they spent. Alternatively, that seems like a lot of work. It's on our website, but you can find it. On the SBB, there is a summary tab that will show it to you. And new for 1617 in the left hand, upper left-hand corner of every single page in the SBB will tell you exactly how much is being spent in that school on that school's budget. But additionally, there are things that we're spending in the schools that the schools don't budget for. So things like utilities, that's spent directly in a school but never shows up on a school's budget. Transportation, so we talk about transportation. We spend about $20 million a year on transportation. The state pays for about four of that. The transportation fee to and from school brings in about 1.5 million. The rest of that money, about $13.5 million, all comes from that $7,000 per pupil. All of that is paying for transportation, for safety and security, property and liability insurance, workers' compensation. All of those things all have to come out of that same pot of money that we have to pay for all of our costs across the entire school district. So we wanted to look at, to give you an idea of costs that you won't see in what the SBBPA is, the number at the top of the sheet. So what costs have gone up for our school district that aren't included in that one number? In the past five years, special education has grown $11 million in our district. It is the first thing that we fund every single new school year is the growth in special education cost. That is not reflected in that $3,900 number, nor do we get funded for it. As I mentioned, the state doesn't fund us to cover that cost. Transportation, even net of the transportation fee, has gone up a million and a half. Our workers' comp and insurance costs have gone up a million dollars. Our certificates of participation, as we mentioned, we haven't been able to pass bonds, so we've been using COPs to meet our most urgent capital needs. We pay $1 million more a year in lease service and our debt service than we did five, six years ago. And utilities are half a million dollars more than they were back then. So while you're not seeing that one specific number, the cost to the school district continue to increase every single year on an ongoing basis. So in the last six years, our cost on just these things are about $300 per student every single year that we have to fund. And those are all monies that are spent either directly in schools or in direct support of schools. So carryover. We do not, 
want schools to participate in a use it or lose it mentality. If you want to save some money for next year, we want you to do that. It promotes efficiency at the building, it promotes taxpayer efficiency. It is really the best practice on to make sure money is spent on what the most urgent needs are. The thing that a lot of people have had confusion on is salary savings. So because we use average salaries, if you happen to be in a school that has staff that's paid less than the average, you don't get to add that to your carryover. And vice versa, if you are in a school that has staff that makes more than the average, that does not take away from your carryover. That's the point of using average salaries instead of actuals. And once the school year is over and we can calculate what carryover is, it's allocated back out to the schools uh, first week of September, and then the schools can distribute that however they may want, however they choose. As an SAC, I would be asking your principal, what is the plan for carryover? So are we holding carryover in case we have an enrollment decline? Are we saving carryover for a big purchase? What is the plan around carryover? When do we plan to spend it? Are we targeting a certain amount? That conversation needs to be happening with the SAC so the SAC can provide that recommendation to the principal. Our school carryover right now stands at about $17.5 million. Um, this is just what we call the general fund. So this does not include full day kindergarten, for example. This is the vast majority of the funding that schools get, but it's increasing, and it's increasing from two main areas. The first is that dollars allocated from the district aren't being spent every year all the time at every school. The second is that the way we have to account for school revenues, so donations, fundraisers, things like that, it has to go into the general fund as well. So as school-based revenues increase and they don't get spent, that contributes to this as well. So in this year, when it grew about $3 million, it was about half and half, half due to school-based revenues increasing more than expenditures, and half due to the SBB not being spent as much as was allocated out. So when you put that together across our neighborhood schools, our schools are carrying over, on average, about $327 per pupil right now. If you want to know how much your school has in carryover, this is a shot of our budget website, kind of showing you how to get there, and then I circled the 14, 15 school and department carryover. You can see every school, every department, how much they are carrying over. If you go down into the years before that, you'll see those years as well, so you can see um, any trends if you want to look at that, but all of that is posted on our website if anyone wants to see that. So really the reason that a lot of people are here to talk about district budget priorities and school level priorities. So this is just representative. This is not um, a com comprehensive list at all. But what would be district decisions versus what would be school decisions? On district decisions, really, compensation and benefits, how much goes into the SBB, and I want to be clear, those are two very different things. How much comp goes into compensation dictates what raises will be next year. How much goes into schools' SBBs determines how much the school will be able to buy in the next year. So it doesn't, they're not linked inherently in that if you get more in SBB, teachers do not get a raise, that they do not have that link at all. And then at the school level, class size, class offering, offerings, how many administrators you have, how you want your administration set up, classified support. So that's just an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about district priorities versus school priorities. Kathy stole my thunder. This is just the language around the SAC, providing recommendations to the principal about their spending priorities. I talk about this, I've been out to a few SACs this year, is that the principal is the executive in the building and is the one who has to make the decision and the one who's held accountable to the budget. That the SAC should be involved in this process, it should be collaborative, but at the end they are making a recommendation to the principal on how to spend their monies at their school level. So as you're thinking about priorities, this was shown to the board last week and I just wanted to put it up again. Um, the staff survey that went out, what the staff said, and it was largely what I talked about on the previous page, but this is in order of their priorities. So increasing salary, increasing SBB, increasing benefits in this descending order. So just as a frame of reference, when you're thinking about what priorities you're gonna talk through as a feeder group, this is what uh, came back that was presented to the board last week. So lastly, talking about funding for next year. Right now, Governor Hickenlooper, and he does not set the budget, he requests the budget, the legislature sets the budget, has requested that when you run the School Finance Act, Douglas County School District get five and a half million dollars of new revenue next year. To put that in context, this year we got about 13 million dollars. So while we're going up, we're going up at a much slower rate. And the reason that's happening is, you remember way back at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about the negative factor. He proposed that the negative factor increase next year by 50 million dollars statewide. So the cut to K-12 would grow, 
from about 830 million that it's at now up to 880 million on an annual basis. So um, that is the reason why it's kind of counterintuitive. Well, you're getting $100 per student more. How are you getting cut? And the, what happens is they run the formula and they have to fund inflation and student growth and all these things. They say, okay, Douglas County, you should have gotten actually about $160 a student, but we're going to cut 60 bucks from you. So you do go up at the same time your cut gets bigger. You're just not getting as much as the finance formula actually contemplates. So likely expenditure increases. Para continues by Senate Bill 1 from a few years ago. We're almost at the end of this. Para gets more expensive every single year as a percentage of salary. So even if your salary doesn't change, we have to contribute more to the retirement program. Um, we're up to about 19% this year and we'll be at 19.44 next year. We will get up to 20.15% of salary in two years and then Senate Bill 1 stops the growth will stay at 20.15. So doing nothing, we have no choice but to fund that 1.6 million. Our special education department has requested 1.4 million for increases in certified and classified staff. And if we assume what I think is a modest 5% growth in medical benefit costs at this point, in a district our size, that's 1.7 million. So right off the bat, we've spent 4.7 million of the 5.5 before we've done anything else. Again, this is a likely scenario. We have to propose our budget to the board. The board has to vote to adopt it. We still have a long way to go in the legislative process. We usually don't know what our funding is until the end of April, beginning of May. But right now, this is what we know from the governor and what we are um, forecasting as far as expenditure increases next year simply on retirement, medical benefits, and the special education increase for next year. So with that, that small amount of information. I almost stayed within my time limit, but um, I made Senator promise me that there'd be time for questions. So um, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to take those. 